Would you welcome Pepo? I've never hugged a swimmer. <laughs> well, Ever kissed one? You just yeah, did. Yeah. <laughs> I became Jesus only. <laughs> right. That's what we do all the time in Italy. Two kisses. And make sure that you start from the hard side. Some people get messed up and you end up smacking somebody in the lips. You don't want to really do that. I mean. <laughs> but people ask, you know, why in the world Italy? You got all the churches, you got people talking about God, and as the pastor said, you have a situation where they think they have a monopoly on God and they're still spiritually bankrupt. I didn't know this until very, very recently, but 95% of the churches in Rome, and there is over a thousand of them, are built on pagan temples. What is that going to do? Think about it. Think about it. There is so much darkness. When you go into countries like Forma was saying, oh, well, <clears throat> people in Africa have nothing and have everything. And it's true. In Italy, they are the opposite. They think they have everything. Fast cars, nice clothes, wine, woman. They think they have everything, but they have nothing. Absolutely nothing. So the struggle that we have there is that they've been vaccinated enough with the gospel so that they don't catch the disease. And what we want, we want them to be contagious. And there is a huge difference between the two things. One time recently, there was this woman that came to the study, and she said, she was listening to what I was saying, and she said, Papo, you're preaching a different Christ. And I thought, oops, I'm in trouble now. You know, what am I doing wrong? And she said, well, the Christ that I know is on the cross. He's suffering. He's in pain. He's gloomy. He's dark. He is, he's something that I don't feel comfortable approaching. Your Christ is gone, is risen, is risen. He cares. He loves me. He wants to be with me. He wants to give me a life that I don't have. That's a different Christ. Amen to that. And a lot of them don't experience that. They're so blind because the enemy has blinded them. Take care of the tradition, but don't think about a relationship. Oh, no, 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 no. That's dangerous. They think you're a cook, you know, if you have a relationship. So what do you have? You have 98% of the population. Oops, I didn't start the clock. Sorry, Bob. Uh, it's ticking right now. Hang on here. You know, start the clock. Okay. <laughs> um, the problem is 98% of the population goes to church, technically speaking. Then when they do actual analysis, they see that about 40% goes 15 times or more. There is only 0.7%, less than 0.8% of the population that has a relationship with Christ. That's sad. I mean, we send people to Africa, India, and so on and so forth, they have more there. Not only that, but since they never heard, they're willing to receive it. You go to a place where they've heard and say, no, you know what, yeah, I heard that, been there, done that, I don't care. You have a hardened heart. And that is so much harder to change, so much harder. So it's a huge, huge challenge. Um, one thing about prayer, you know, Italians are very superstitious. Remember, 2,000 years ago, we had gods for everything, you know, you name it, for love, for war, for this, for that, for the other. So that tradition continue on. I saw a statistic recently that blew me away. Most of the Italian, those who pray, pray to Padre Pio. Probably you guys never even heard of Padre Pio. He was a friar that died in 1962. Supposedly, he received a stigmata. He did some miracles. So what do people do? They pray to him. So they are praying to what? Whoever gives me the deal that I want. I don't care who it is. Just give me the deal. That's not God. He's not your puppet. Give me, give me. No. Christ was number seven on that list number seven on the list. He didn't even make the podium. And we're calling it a Christian nation? It's disgrace. But you can get into that mentality. You know, 2 Timothy says, they are holding on to a form of godliness, but deny the power. 
They are learning, but they never come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why? It's all head knowledge. And you talk to the Romans, man, they're so arrogant. They know everything. They know everything. They did something 2,000 years ago. They haven't done anything since, but man, they own the world, you know, if you talk to them. It's unbelievable. So sometimes it's easy to point the finger because I have to look at my own life and say, am I holding on to a form of godliness and denying the power? These times are tough, guys, for everyone. How do we walk daily? Do we walk with our head down, complaining, grumbling, and mumbling because everything that is happening around us is affecting us? Or do we walk with our eyes fixed on Jesus saying, oh, you know what? This is meant to be, but I don't need to be like everybody else. Amen. You don't have a testimony without a test. How do you run through your test in life? How do you overcome it? With your own strength? I tell you, swimming 54 miles, yeah, it, it's tough. I did it in my own strength. But then I realized I need something bigger than that. And that's my search for God. I started right there at 15. I was looking for power. Where is the power? And I went into the occult, looking at the occult, and I thought, whoa, there is power, but it's a bit weird. Until God basically showed me, you're looking in the wrong places, buddy. You know, and I came to a surrender to him. But how do we pray? How do we pray? Do we pray with that conviction? Italians, they, they crack me up. I'll give you a little vignette. One guy in my study, he um, um, came one day, and generally I'm the one that prays in the group, you know, because they're new at this. You know, it's going to take him some time. He said, Peppo, can I, can I open up in prayer for you? I said, sure. You know, that would be great. So he starts, and then all of a sudden the spirit is getting a tug in his heart. He's getting all choked up and He's starting to cry a little bit. You know, I like that. You guys, you guys are like the Italians. Yeah, I see emotions, you know. I see the pastor, you know, weeping. That's, that's good stuff. So to me, that's, that's exciting, right? And there is a lady there, a very formal lady. He's looking at him. He goes, what's the matter with you? What is the matter with you? Look at you like a baby. You're crying like a baby. Just grow up. Shake it out right in the middle of his prayer. Right in the middle of his prayer. So he stops and looks at her and goes, would you just shut up so I can finish my prayer? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the type of people that, are, that I'm dealing with. Or sometimes maybe I might be praying for somebody, you know, where they're holding hands and praying for, for Joe because of his family situation. And right away, the lady is special, you know. Oh, what happened to Joe? I didn't hear anything about Joe. You know, right there in the middle of the prayer, you know, talking to each other, saying, what, what's going on with him? I want to know. I mean, they love gossip. Anyway, so that, that's the older crowd, right? That's the older crowd. They're, they're tougher to change. But, but the younger crowd is, 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 is hurting. They don't have any role models. They look at the government as a mess. They look at the church, there are scandals. They look at teachers. My daughter, she's going through hell. <clears throat> because as a mission, you go there, you put out, put out, put out, and people don't know what you go through, the struggle that you go through as, <clears throat> as the one that is bringing the good news. But the enemy attacks us, but when he goes to the little one, oh man, it takes me off. And uh, so she's broken up because in school, it's a very much of a shame-based system. You're stupid. You amount to nothing. nothing. You're good for nothing. But that's what they do. They keep putting you down and down and down. These kids start believing in it. I'm good for nothing. So there is all this anger that starts building up in them. And I'm seeing Isabella. She was so happy-go-lucky, always smiling, always jumping, always getting to know people. And that flower is just wilting away. So, talking to the youth, I've seen a huge difference. The old guys, they have been hardened by the crucible of life. And their heart needs to be broken by God. The young ones are just like clay that hasn't been molded yet. And they love to be molded by somebody they can trust, somebody that is transparent, somebody that cares, that really truly loves them. Why? Because they're not receiving any love from anyone. Even their own parents, they're too busy with the mistress or too busy with business. They just give them money and get out of my face. They don't quite say it that way, but that's the bottom line. I'd rather give you money and have you do whatever you want, but don't bother me. Is that how you're protecting your investment? you are being blessed with kids and you have to be a good steward with them and set the right example. They, they just don't care. And then problems start coming, and they go, what do I do now? Well, you haven't been there for 15 years. Now you're waking up, and you realize they have a son. 
It's easy to have sons. It's much harder to be a father. I have a little tape I would like to roll. Um, this is a group that came from the U.S. about a month and a half ago. They came to Italy and they said, Peppa, what do we do? Uh, we want to do something evangelistic. And I said, no, well, giving out tracts doesn't really work, but I tell you what, let's push some feet to the gospel. And the school that my daughter is going to, it's a mess. You know, there are graffitis everywhere, weeds up to here. It's just terrible. It looks like a ghetto almost. And I said, let's go in there and clean up graffitis. So I talked to the principal of the school. She said, oh, that's a great idea. I talked to the city. I said, well, I will need some equipment. Oh, yeah, we provide you with this, that, and the other. Comes the 11th hour, obviously, typical Italian. We don't have money. We don't have equipment. We have nothing. So I went down to the, you know, the equivalent of Home Depot, picked up a bunch of stuff, and we got to work. But I told the principal, give me those kids that did the graffitis. I'm going to bring the American guys, but I want also the troublemakers. And so they came, and they hung out for two days with us, working away. So if you can roll, we're going to hear two testimonies of a couple of the kids from this San Diego Christian school. Like this, like this I think, doesn't happen. Or if it happens, it's very, very rare. Uh, so you've got something different with the new. I mean, the reason why you're here um, is something which I didn't know. That's why I came to meet you. And uh, even more important for us is that what you did today um, was spreading around you and uh, a little influencing our students. Mm -hmm. This is something completely different from Italy. In Italy, people are not used to help others. But our students came this morning working with you. They saw you and I think they really understood there is a different way to live. So they, they felt this. There is no one like our God. There is no one like you, God. For greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done. We took all those kids right after we worked at the school and, and we had lunch together. And that one guy that was sharing from the stage actually shared the testimony, a personal testimony in the park. And, and this girl never heard anything like it. And she said, I would remember for the rest of my life. So this is something new to them. People don't share their belief. They don't share their conviction. Why? Because it's just a matter of tradition. It's very sterile. Is very traditional. There is no life in it, and they're not drawn to that. And then all of a sudden, here's a man. At 12, he started heavy drugs. They got off heavier by the time he was 14, very expensive, so he had to become a dealer. And then somebody cared enough for him to say, come with me. You know, we're going together to hear this one pastor. And then little by little, he just got cleaned up, and now he has a beautiful Bible study that he runs with a bunch of kids. So that's very unusual very unusual to them. And you can say, no, Peppa, why in the world are you casting this vision here? Well, for one, you know, again, I know Raquel for, for quite some time, and she said, no, why don't you come? And two, thank you to Pastor Bob for, for having me here, just sharing a little glimpse of what it is. But also, more importantly, we're here in Italy because we're asking people, you know, to help us with what's going on in Italy. If you remember the parable of the paraplegic, he has some good friends that took him in front of Jesus. They were committed to take him there because they knew that something would happen to this man. They had such a strong conviction. But what did they do? They ended up on the roof. They tore up. They tore up the roof to lower that guy. And God did a miracle. But now you got a homeowner with a hole on his roof. Who's going to take care of that? So I don't mind going out there. I don't mind being one of these guys that takes people and breaks up roofs so that people can meet Jesus. But we need people behind us that can be roof repairers as well. And unfortunately, there is one, one thing that is hard for us because we cannot do what makes a lot of sense, which is raise the support in Italy, not just do that. Paul says something in 2 Corinthians one time, and he, saw, he said to the Corinthian church, I never ask you for a dime, and I will never do that. I robbed other churches to do this. And I never quite understood what's going on. But then, as you're reflecting, we are looked at differently. We are the cult. 
we are the weirdos. We are the ones that are going to be changing people's minds so we can take their money. That's the way they view us. Why? Because there is a lot of that stuff going on, right? False teachers going around. And unfortunately, if I ever had to ask something to them on a financial side, it would say, ah, it took you five years, it took you six years, but ah, here it is. You don't care for us. That's what it is. They were right. You're trying to brainwash us. So that is a big challenge to us. And how do I respond to that? How do I respond to the people that still are hardened? How do I respond to people that criticize us and come up with lies? We're talking last night about lies that have been said about us, that crush us when we put out our own finances, our own family, our own time, and that's the payback, it hurts. But God says, consider it a blessing when you're persecuted and falsely accused in my name. If you are accused because of your own stupidity, that's a different ballgame, okay? You deserve it. But, but if, if you're persecuted in his name, then it's different. And I'm going to leave you with one example that really touched me. On the way over to the U.S., I was looking at the scriptures in um, Acts 7, the whole issue of Stephen being martyred, falsely accused to the point of death. Where is Christ right now? Question to you guys. Where is Christ right now? In heaven? Where, where is Christ right now? Christ, not the Holy Spirit, Christ. He ascended to heaven and sat at the right hand of God, right? That's what happened. He rose. He's not there anymore. He rose and sat at the right hand of God, right? We see that in many different scriptures. Mark, Matthew, Ephesians talks about that. What happened with Stephen? It's beautiful. His eyes were gazing into heaven, and what did he see? Christ standing, standing at the right hand of God. To me, that's exciting. Christ is not sitting anymore. He is ready to die for him. And Christ is saying, oh, yes, way to go. Yes. He's just cheering him on. What can I do today to make him stand up in the midst of trials and tribulation? That is awesome to get a standing ovation from God. <laughs> You know, the pastor said I'm a swimmer. I love everything that has to do with, with water and fishing. I'm a, I'm a spear fisherman as well. I love that stuff. But I heard one time one person saying something that is very profound. He said, any dead fish can float downstream. But to be spiritually fit is what you need to swim upstream. And some of you today said, oh, I'm floating. I'm, I'm going. I'm moving. You are dead. You can float with the current and everybody else, but you're dead. So start getting going and start getting spiritually fit. God bless you.